Ooh, here we go. There you go, my people. That is today's POD. Please copy that one down. This is one of those where we're going to evaluate um, an expression. You need to copy the expression. One fourth, and then you've got square brackets, 27a minus four squared minus three c. What? I'll need you guys to raise your hand because I've minimized the video. If you guys can raise your hand on your screen, then I'll see it when you are ready. This one took a little bit more time because there are multiple steps to this particular algebraic expression. Yesterday, we had Mackenzie sharing. We also had Ben and Gianna this week. Um, raise your hand if you'd like to walk us through how to do this particular POD. And then we're going to talk about the prop, no, you're the first to raise your hand. I'm assuming you raised your hand. If you have a question, you could ask a question. I'm not trying to force you to walk us through this. Is that what you were gonna do, no? Uh, yeah, I was gonna walk us through it. Oh, fantastic, love it. Okay, um, now guys, this is the point. Now I know sometimes we go a little bit quickly, but we only have a 43 minute class period. So at this moment, if you haven't had a chance to finish, that's okay. I would love it if you transition to using a red pen right now, because this is the beginning of our group think. Now, if you're close to the end and you want to finish it with pencil, that's also okay. Noel, what does the substitution look like? That's going to be step one. Um, the substitution is, wait, what do you mean by that? Just like, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so 27 times three nice. is, sorry, um, walk, I'm just going to do this part right here, bud. I want to just do the full substitution. What should I put instead of C? Oh, instead of A, you, I would put three. Yeah, that I did that. And I'm going to go ahead and sub out the C as well. Um, and that would be, C would be five. Brilliant. Okay. So guys, that is always step one, show the substitution. And now you can start walking me through the process that you had there. Now, hang on. I need to do a, like these nested expressions are sometimes confusing because we can use parentheses for multiplication and we can use parentheses for grouping. When I put three times five, I put that inside parentheses, but then I'm going to put that whole expression also inside grouping symbols. It looks right now. Okay, so then what would you do first, Noah, after we've done the substitution? Um, I would change um, yeah, one fourth down in brackets, then I'd put 81. Nice. Minus parentheses, four squared. Yeah, four squared. Are we gonna do this step at a time? Perfect. Yeah, um, minus nine. Check that again. Minus what? Oh, sorry. 15. 15. Perfect. Okay. I saw, I saw it wrong. Yep. Okay. Now what? Um, we're going to put one fourth in brackets again. So we're going to put the 81 too. And then minus um, parentheses 16. 
minus 15. Um, and I just put it back down. Yeah, the same thing. So I subtracted those and I got one. And uh, I sorry, I got 80. Oh, yeah. So after that, I got 80. Yep. And I put 80 over one. And that's 80 over four. So that would be equal to 20. Awesome, no? Now you just went step by step. So you, you were following the protocol that we have started to follow when we're doing um, an order of operations problem. So we call those PEMDAS problems, yeah? And you just do one thing at a time and you keep bringing it down. I really appreciate the substitution first making sure that you've subbed out all your variables and then you walked through that math brilliantly. So thank you very much. I think I wrote your name down. Fantastic guys. Any questions about the POD? We have one more tomorrow on September 11th um, and then you will take a picture of it and you'll upload it to Black Audit. Okay, brilliant. So now transition people, I want you to grab your homework um, from last night. Now, you probably didn't write down what your strategy was, but with your red pen, as we talk about this, I want you to write down what your strategy was. Because lesson 1.5 is all about the different um, options you have when you're trying to solve a word problem. Now, we started number five together yesterday in class. And I said, hey, drawing a picture might be a really good way of figuring out this bouncing ball scenario. The other thing, I did take a look at some of your work last night. Some of you guys just had answers. You didn't have units. The units are really important. When you get to 15.6, and then what does that mean, right? I want you guys, here is one of those habits and in our notebook, we're going to put it down as a good practice if we haven't done it yet. I think we call them best practices in your notebook. One of the most important best practices as a mathematician on these word problems, I want you to put your answer in a sentence. What does 15.6 mean? That it bounces every 15.6 seconds? No, 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 no. This answer means on the fifth bounce, the ball bounces to a height of 15.6 feet. So if you did not last night put your answer in a sentence right now with your red pen, you're coaching yourself and you're telling yourself to express your final answer. Oops. You want to express your answer in a statement. Express solution in a sentence. That includes the units. The units are wicked important, as we say in Boston. Now, I also showed my work, right? I expect you to show your work. Now, I used a calculator to do 200 times 0.6, but then I wrote it down. 200 times 0.6 is 120. 120 times 0.6 is 72. 72 times 0.6 is 43.2. I expect you to show your work. Where did 15.6 come from? And I even kept track in my picture of the bounces, first bounce, second bounce, third bounce, all the way up to the fifth bounce. So right now, on your paper, you're coaching yourself. I think one of the things that happened when we transitioned to distance learning in the spring of your fifth grade year is that your process became a private thing. Because you were doing your math privately at home on paper in any way that made sense, and because we transitioned so quickly to distance learning, Ms. Hayward was just saying, hey, just give me your answers in a Google Doc. And I think what you guys became focused on is that you needed to get the right answer. And that's important. But what I want you to focus on now as a sixth grader, and we have a new way of sharing our work, process is important. How you got the answer is what I want to know now that I'm teaching you pre-algebra. Any questions? Emma actually, actually, I do. Okay, I got... Emma, hang on. Emma, raise your hand. So Emma, 
I'm gonna have you ask a question. And then Noel, I think that was you. Actually, you did have a question. So was that you, Noel? Yes. Okay, so let's let Emma go first. And then if we can just like get in the habit of raising our hand, then we don't talk over each other. It gets weird when we have to unmute. Emma, what's up? Um, so the on your screen, it says the height of 15.6 feet. But yeah. it says on the question, round it to the nearest 10. Is 0.6 not the nearest 10? I'm confused. So if I, so if I put this, so this is a really good question. I'm so glad you're asking it. So if I put this, or I'm going to use purple. Look for purple emerging on the screen. That right there. If I put 25.92, 25.92, and I multiply that by 0.6 on my calculator, I get my answer is 15.552. That's what the calculator tells me. Now, when I round it to the tenths place, that's why it says 15.6. Does that make sense? You're right. I love that you recognized in the instructions that your request was to round your final answer to the tenths place, and 15.6 is indeed rounded to the tenths place. I hope that answers your question, Emma. Noel, what about you? I've got a different answer from the calculator. Did you do the same process as I did, or what did you do for your process? Um, I made like a mini chart thing. Yeah, like a T-chart? Um, yeah, but um, kind of. But when I um, multiplied 0 0.6 times 15, um, wait. Did you go one bounce too far? I'm not sure. I got my answer was 15.50 after I rounded it. Yeah, so did you so the question might be, you know what happens with rounding Noel? At some point, like you can see, I'm I rounded it to 43.2 right there. And then for whatever reason in, in the world of my brain, when I got to bounce number four, I kept it at the hundreds place. I don't know why, I just did. Um, and then I put 25.92 into my calculator and I multiplied that by 0 0.6. And then I rounded my final answer. So at some point along the way, every single bounce, um, if you didn't round in the same way that I rounded, your answer is gonna be slightly off. And I'm not overly concerned about that. If you have the same general approach, now you might not have drawn a bouncing ball on your graph paper like I did, that's okay. But if you have an approach where you were multiplying by 0 0.6 over and over again, then that you're golden. That's what we really wanted you to do is recognize that five times you're multiplying by 0 0.6. Okay. And some of you might have actually gone so sophisticated. Some of you might have said zero, 200 times 0 0.6 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. What? Did, would that get you there? Maybe, right? Any other questions about number five? That rounding thing could, could be a tricky um, spot. It, it, it could lead to slightly different answers, but, but what Noel is describing makes good sense. And Emma, I'm so glad you brought up the concern about rent rounding. When do you round? And, and maybe your observation is that bounce number four, I kept it at the hundredths place for whatever reason. At the very end, I made sure to round to the tenth place, but you're right, on bounce number four, I didn't. I don't think that that two in the hundredths place should have significantly changed the answer, though. All right, we're moving on to number seven. I, I let you skip number six. That problem always causes a lot of issues because it's just complicated with all of those different times for those, those songs. But for number seven, here's my strategy. I decided to make a table. So I did a picture for number five, a diagram or a picture. And then for number seven, I decided to make a table. I decided to keep track of all of the different combinations I could get when I throw two number cubes down the table. I can get a one and a one. I can get a one and a two. And so there's my table of all, this is the sample space. These are all of the possible outcomes. And then I just grabbed a highlighter and I highlighted every combination that has a sum that's less than eight. So there are 21 ways to roll a sum that is less than eight. So remember, I want your answer to be in a statement. Please make sure that you have your answer in a statement. 
21 ways to roll a sum that is less than eight. Did anybody else do something similar to this or how did you approach it guys? I'm curious to know how you approached it. I did it the exact same way. Really? Cool. Who was that? Was that Luke? Cause I don't have my camera on. Uh, yes, but yeah. instead of drawing like all of the combinations, I just drew the combinations like, like I just drew numbers from one to six and then for like one I'd put two ones for two I'd put uh so like let's say I I was doing one first I would put one 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 two one three one four one five one six yep and then when you got to the twos did you just not include two one because you already had one two written down Sometimes people just don't bother with the ones they've already written. Um, I, I, I just did that. Yeah, yeah, cool. So you kind of had the same idea that it would be useful to write down all of the combinations. Anthony, your hand shot up. How did you approach it? So I drew like a model kind of thing. So I drew like two dice for like everything. And then I did like one plus one, one plus two, then until like one plus six, but then I skipped one plus two for the next one, then I do like two plus two, then two plus three, then two plus four, then two plus five. Then after that, um, I skipped the three plus one, and then I just did three plus two, and then three plus three, and then three plus four. Then I did four plus two, and then four plus three. So that's interesting. You're skipping the two and the one and the three and the one. So, but you're not skipping the three and the two, even though you already have a two and a three, right? So this is a definite issue about does order matter? Oops, why is it doing that? I want it to be on purple. So some people would argue that rolling a two and a three is the same as rolling a three and a two. So the question you have to ask yourself is does order matter? It was a little ambiguous on this one. I just, I counted them as two distinctly different number cubes. And so in my opinion, in this situation, yeah, yeah, it does. I could roll a two on one number cube and a three on the other, and that could be flip flop and be a three and a two. So Anthony, you probably don't have the same answer that I have then, because you're not counting all of the, the repetition. Like I'm counting one and three as a different roll than three and one. So it's possible you have a slightly different answer because you're not counting repetition. And that's okay. Did you have a different answer, Anthony? Wait, for what? Or number seven, how many different ways there are to roll a sum that's less than eight? I think I got 15. Yes. And the reason why you don't have 21 is because you didn't count the duplication of a one and a three and a three and a one. So on your paper, you're going to coach yourself that you saw the problem differently than I did. You're just going to write, I didn't count the duplicates. For me, I chose to count the duplicates. Fair enough? Mm -hmm. Brilliant. All right, so I'm going to move on to the next one. Now, for the next one, this was the catch of the um, what time. It really isn't catch a bus. This problem was about what time does this person need to wake up? What's the latest possible wake time? And I decide to work backwards, right? That, that the bus, this is what it is. The bus, they have to catch the bus at 730. And then these are all of the things that the person needs to do in the morning. So I just kept track of it. Now, notice. I am showing my work. You guys have to figure out how to show your work on paper. You can't just say, well, I just subtracted it all in my head. Okay, good for you. I wanna see what your process was. I took 30 minutes away from 7.30 and then I took 15 minutes away from seven o'clock and then I took 10 minutes away from that 6.45. So show your process. It doesn't have to look like mine, but I need to see something on paper. Um, Anthony, your hand shot up. Um, so what if I wrote 635, what, should I put AM after it too? Yeah, so then with okay. your pen, and you guys are probably working with a, a red pen, you're just going to put AM, and then you're just going to remember that units are important. AM is considered a unit for time. Is it AM or is it PM? You're not wrong. Remember, I don't grade you on precision. I grade you on, on, on your effort. Like now you're just coaching yourself to remember that. So students are reluctant to coach themselves because they think that they're making um, a comment that makes them look like they did something wrong. We are just practicing together. We're just making sure that our final answer is a well-written answer. 
6.35 a.m. is the latest possible wake time. So there is my statement. I want you guys to write your answers in a statement. If I were to give you a quiz on problem solving and you didn't write your answer in a statement, I'd probably mark some partial credit off, right? I need those units and I want those statements. Brilliant, moving on to number nine, the Mr. and Mrs. Delgado question. Um, they own equal shares. So for me, I decided, well, I think I'm gonna write an equation. We've been doing this interpreting verbal statements into algebraic expressions, but I decided, well, what if I thought about that with variables? Now you guys might not have thought with variables. What I wrote down was that they each have the same amount. They had equal shares. So Mr. Delgado has X and Mrs. Delgado has X, but we don't know how much that is. But we were told that one of them sold a third of their shares for $2,700. That was a clue. That was a really important clue. So I worked backwards from there. Well, if that's true, then if I multiply 2,700 times three, I'm gonna figure out how much the one person had, right? That could be, I don't remember which one, if it was Mr. or Mrs. Let's just say Mr. Delgado sold a third of his for $2,700. Well, then I have to add 20, the 8,100 and the 8,100 together. The total value of their stock was $16,200. Again, there's my statement and I'm showing my process. You guys have to show your process. And the last one you had to do was I just worked backwards. Um, they gave you a series of statements and I just chose the opposite. The ended with 45 and I worked backwards. Instead of adding five, I subtracted five. Instead of multiplying by three, I divided by three. I used inverse operations to figure out that the original number is 12 according to those clues. What questions do you guys have? I think that last one was, oh no, no, there was one more, yikes. Yeah, the Brian and Camila's age. I wrote an equation for that one too. Now, I, I lean on, on equations a lot because I teach algebra. And so I see the benefit of equations. But you could have used guess and check on this one, I suppose. They gave you some clues that right now um, and then four years from now. Those were the clues that you had. Uh-oh, we lost someone. Thomas's hand is up. What's going on? Is it time for you guys to leave? All right, so I got three and nine. Now check that. Because uh, three, three times nine, nine um, er, three times three is nine, and then three plus four is seven, and nine plus four is 14. Nine plus four um, is 13. So it works. It doesn't work. Nine plus four is 13. It almost works. So oh. So close, so close. Hey, tell you what, guys, um, good news, bad news. Good news for you guys is um, it's time for you to leave. Well, that's bad news. Leaving class is always bad news. We, uh, we are out of time, right? No, wait, wait a second. Why is Jackie joining my class right now? I'm a little bit confused. We get to go until 930. Never mind. I'm going to forget the good news, bad news. I'm going to let Jackie sit in the waiting room for a second. She maybe doesn't realize I'm teaching. Um, never mind. I got distracted. So Thomas, do you see that you were so close, Peace? So currently their ages, um, one is three times the age of the other, but in four years, one will be two times the age of the other. So right now, Camila is four and Brianna is 12. And four years from now, um, they'll be 16 and eight and it, it hits that second clue. So the equation is the fast way to get there but maybe um, you didn't know how to use the equation. So maybe you had to guess and check some ages. And the problem is like, where do you start on these guesses? Like Camila could be 10. Okay, so then if Camila is 10, then we're gonna do times three and you're gonna guess and check forever. Anthony, what was your question, my friend, your statement? Um, so for that equation three X plus four, how do like we solve it? Like, because yeah. I'm not really sure how to do that. Yeah, because this is definitely advanced algebra. Like, the, do you understand what my equation means? That four years from now, so I'm going to say that Brianna is currently three years older, and so I at three times as old, and then I added four. So I'm letting the x equal. And then four years from now, this is what Camila is, right? So there's my Camila, and there's my Brian. So I don't know if you even understand how I wrote my equation. But if you did understand my equation, 
then we have this situation where I've got to figure out the 3x plus 4 and the 2x. If I bring my variables together, I'm going to have just 1x, and that's going to get me to that 4. I don't want to get too hung up on the algebra because you guys aren't quite there yet. But guess and check, which is I think is what Thomas was approaching it from a guess and check perspective, just that one addition error through you. But you had that, you kind of were moving in the right direction, Thomas, for sure. Hey guys, I'm going to stop sharing the um, homework because I want to make sure that we have time to look at what you, what I want you to do for tonight. So can you guys transition with me and can we move over here to our notes section, please? I know that somebody else had their hand up. Luke, I'm sorry, I cut you off on the problem solving, but I, I'm looking at the clock. We can come back and talk about the problem solving if we have some time at the end of class. But I wanna make sure that we have time to go to our notes. Yesterday, we didn't take notes because yesterday it was all about just doing some problem solving. And we talked about the idea yesterday. We already wrote down some notes for problem solving for lesson 1.1. But in your table of contents, guys, on page five, we're now going to talk about ordered pairs and relations. And I'm really going to talk more about relations than ordered pairs because I know you already know a little bit about ordered pairs. You guys did it for your summer math. Um, so we're going to talk about the X and Y that you get when you, when you plot something on a coordinate plane. But I really want to focus on what a relation is and the domain and range because I don't think you guys know that. Anthony. I see your hand going up. What's going on? For the properties and numbers for like lesson 1.4, is it okay if we use like kind of like three pages to do all the notes? For sure. So if you end up, because we took a lot of notes on that. So Anthony, if you use three pages, then you're just going to put a different page number here. You're not going to be on page eight. You might be on page 10. So all of our notebooks are going to end up looking a little bit different over time because we all have different size handwriting. So that's totally fine. Luke, what's your question? Um, on the thing you put um, uh, 9.9, 9, you put September 9th in. It's the 10th. Thank you. Yeah, we skipped over. Thank you, Luke. I love it. You guys are holding me to my accuracy, and that's fantastic. Okay, so we're going to go to the next available page in our notebook, and you guys are going to determine what page that is. And we're going to put the heading at the top, and the heading is ordered pairs and relations. And there's a reason why this textbook is putting these two topics together in one lesson. By the way, this is lesson 1.6. We're moving on to lesson 1.6. All right, guys, we have, I'm watching the clock. We have seven minutes. Well, it depends on what clock we consult. We have eight minutes according to my computer. Um, class ends at 9.30. And I'm going to post the homework, but not quite yet. Well, okay, so what is an ordered pair? What is an ordered pair? Can anybody remember? You guys did this on your summer math and it was all of these different summer related items like sunscreen and sunglasses and flip flops and beach balls. Do you remember that? Well, what it was it? all about ordered pairs. What's an ordered pair? Is that you know? I remember the worksheet. I don't remember what it is. Ah, but you do remember doing it? Okay, yeah. that's good. That's a good a move in the right direction. Can anybody describe? Anthony, your hand is shooting up. Thank you. It's like on the coordinate plane. Um, <laughs> it's like going either from like the, I know it's like going like, yeah, the X axis and then it goes to the Y axis. Yes. Oh, Anthony, yeah, that's great. You guys are remembering some of the key things. Yeah, these are X's and Y's. These are locations on the coordinate plane. Now that's fantastic. Now in, in chapter one of the pre-algebra book, we don't even start talking about positive and negative numbers, right? But you guys know a coordinate plane is an x-axis and a y-axis. I assume that you guys have some familiarity with this, right? And that the x-axis is the horizontal number line and that the y-axis is the vertical number line. And the coordinate plane is just two number lines that intersect um, at 90 degrees to one another. So they're perpendicular. And they create this grid, right? It's a grid that we can use to locate, we can locate points. So every point, a point is designated by where is it on the horizontal number line and then where is it on the vertical number line? And we call an ordered pair a point. Ordered pair. So Anthony, what were you gonna say about that? 
Um, I know like there's these um four different sections of it, and like the right, the top right is like positive, positive. Yeah. And like the and then one next to it is like I think positive, negative. It's, it happens to be negative positive because this is in the negative direction and this is in the positive direction. Oh, good. And then, like, I think it, under that, on the bottom left, it's like negative, negative. Yeah. And then it's then positive, negative. Okay, brilliant. You guys are remembering some things. The most important thing for you guys to focus on right now is we're going to focus on quadrant one, where everything is positive. When we get into chapter two, we're going to look at the entire coordinate plane, but I want you to focus just on quadrant one. So we can even make it like this, guys. And I will post these notes um, in, in Blackboard on our bulletin board. We're just going to focus on the X and the Y in quadrant one where everything is positive. Your ordered pair, the most important thing is that you first, you always first make reference to where it is horizontally, that's X comes before Y. So if I have this ordered pair right here, do, 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 that's the ordered pair. Well, you guys tell me, what is that ordered pair? That little red dot on the coordinate plane, what would be the location? Anthony is a frequent flyer and so is Noel. You guys have been actively contributing and Luke, the three of you, Thank you. Anybody else willing to, and Thomas, okay. I can predict. Kiara, there's a new volunteer in the house. Kiara, what's that ordered pair, girl? Uh, wait, where is it again? Right there. I'm zooming in. Okay. Um, it, no, three. Three, four. Close. How, how far do I go up? Whoop, boop, boop. Three, two. Does that make sense? I go over oh, three, three and then three. I go up two. Yeah, three, two. Now, all of these things are really important. The parentheses are really important. Ordered pairs live inside parentheses, and they're always separated by a comma. So some of your homework tonight is just this kind of stuff, and I know you're good at it, and we're only focusing on quadrant one. Well, then what the, why on earth are we talking about relations? And I only have three minutes to talk about relations with you. Okay, so what is a relation then, people? A relation is just a group of ordered pairs. It's kind of like a group of geese is called a gaggle, right? Is that true? A group of cows is called a herd. A group of ordered pairs is called a relation. And we're going to look at relations. So we can have a set of ordered pairs. And our set of ordered pairs, our relation might be in a, in a table instead of on the coordinate plane. You could have a whole group of ordered pairs just listed with their x and y values, right? So I can have the ordered pair 3, 2. That's the one we just did. And I could have the ordered pair 0, 5. And I could have the ordered pair 1, 6, et cetera. And then this, this T chart would be saying, well, this is the relation we're talking about. It's just different ways of expressing the same ideas. Inputs, outputs, inputs, outputs. That's what's going on here, right? This is my input and this is my output. Fair enough, inputs, outputs. Now we're running out of time here. We got two minutes. Here's the thing, within this, this herd of ordered pairs that we call a relation, we often want to talk about the inputs, just the inputs. And that is, that is the domain. The domain is the set of X values within a relation. So it's a subgroup of this herd. And then the range, well, guess what? That's the set of all of the outputs or all of the Y values. We have inputs, they're my domain, and we have outputs, they are the range. Is that okay with you guys? So if I was asked, what is the domain of this example relation, and it's only three ordered pairs, I would say, and I use capital D for domain, and I would say, now here's the thing, sets of numbers, this is really critical, guys, 
Sets of numbers don't live in parentheses. Ordered pairs live in parentheses. Sets of numbers live inside curly braces. So when someone says, what's the domain? I know I'm going to give a set of numbers. I open up curly braces. And then I look at all of these. I've got this, I've got this, I've got this. Here's the one rule you got to remember. When you give me the domain, give me the domain in numerical order. So here's my domain, zero, because it comes numerically first, and then one, and then three. And then I'm going to shut it down. So you state it in numerical order. And if we had had one that repeated, we wouldn't say it. So if it was three, two, and three, five, we don't include the repeats when we say the domain. We say these are the places on the x axis where you're going to find um, one of these ordered pairs in my relation. You're going to find one at zero on the horizontal axis. You're going to find one at one and one at three. And now the same thing happens for the range, guys. The range is a set of numbers. I open up my curly braces and then I just go in there and say, okay, what's happening here? Oh, those are already in numerical order. That's really lovely. I just drop those in. Bloop, bloop, bloop. And if there were repeats, I also wouldn't include those. We can talk more about relations, but basically that's all it is. It's fancy vocabulary just to say, okay, now I've got more than one ordered pair. I've got a group of ordered pairs. I can, re I can state that as a chart as opposed to a set of uh, a list of, of X's and Y's. Does that make sense, guys? Okay. I am going to stop recording right now. You guys, the homework is going to be this kind of stuff. I will post my notes. This